Hey guys, thanks for tuning in. Today we're gonna to talk about how this 10 plus year old designed water pump is way more modern and advanced than what comes on the new cars. Let's get the water pump unboxed. So as you can see, this is an OEM pump. So it's the same part that goes to the dealer, but these markings are removed. Video and Continental are considered OEM. Now, some of you guys may be wondering why I didn't go for the all aluminum pump with this part being aluminum as well, the new updated pump that's offered third party. I just didn't want to take a chance. I know this works, it's OEM, and it will last at least another 60,000 miles. So that's why I opted to go this route, just sticking with what BMW would be installing on their cars. And if you've been following my channel for a while, you'll know that I don't always put OEM parts on my car when I can save money, and that can be frowned upon depending on how you look at it. But for something like this, something that could leave you on the side of the road, 110% I'd recommend that you go OEM and don't take a chance. And on the delta in cost between an aftermarket model, which may come in at like 160 or $180 versus an OEM pump for 300 and change, there's not much to think about there. So that's a new hose that will go between the thermostat housing and the water pump. And new water pump bolts, uh, you're probably gonna be removing one-time use aluminum ones if you're changing it for the first time. These are regular steel bolts from the looks of it, so they're supposed to be replaced every time you change your water pump. All right, so eventually this is gonna be a DIY later in this video, and my goal is to try to make it one of the easier DIYs you're gonna see. Uh, to save you some time potentially. We'll try to remove as little as possible and get this replaced as fast as possible. But the premise of this video is to talk about how this particular pump is much more advanced than modern BMW pumps. They had to go back to a mechanical, traditional style water pump. And I think the reason they had to go back to a traditional water pump on their regular inline sixes and four cylinders, etc., is the fact that these would not last more than about 80,000 miles, even though they had a bunch of benefits and then there's class action lawsuits and settlements and all that. Even though this was a superior design, I don't think people were willing to pay the premium for the advantages of this compared to a traditional water pump. And then they had to revert back to older designs. And in a way, your 10 plus year old BMW is gonna have a more modern water pump design than a 2021 car. So as an FYI, M cars, they always retained a mechanical water pump, even as the regular three series, et cetera, had electronic water pumps. If you guys weren't aware, the N54 has a more aggressive electronic water pump. It draws 400 watts or over half a horsepower compared to the N52's water pump that has a 200 watt demand, even though it makes 75% as much power. So there was a time when the S55 was out and they offered the N55 in the three series and that was running an electronic water pump, whereas the S55 was running a mechanical water pump. It was kind of like they had to tack it on the front of the motor uh, as an afterthought because they designed the block to primarily be uh, running an electronic water pump, but they made the decision on M cars that maybe a mechanical water pump was more appropriate and an electronic water pump wouldn't be able to keep up. So if they made the N54 water pump twice as powerful, they knew that there was gonna be more heat due to the turbos and whatnot, so they had to overrate it. But I don't think they ever anticipated people pushing them to double the power in terms of how they size that water pump if they knew that this car would eventually be making over 500 horsepower in the hands of enthusiasts, probably this wouldn't have had an electronic water pump, it would have had a mechanical pump, it would have been more appropriate because it can keep up with demand at high RPMs and heavy loads. So perhaps the N54 should have come with a mechanical water pump just because of how tunable it is. For all we know, that's not enough for when you're making 500 plus horsepower. Why is cylinder six most prone to misfires? Maybe it has to do with the fact that the coolant can't be pumped through the block fast enough to extract enough heat and the coolant is hotter at the back than it would be at the front and you have uneven burn or you have um, pre-ignition etc because the pump can't pump fluid out of the block fast enough just a theory but if the m cars always retained mechanical pumps but the regular three series would use an electronic water pump even back in the day before all the lawsuits and all the premature failures maybe this car over 400 or 500 horsepower would have benefited from a mechanical water pump. But regardless though, there's still a number of advantages that made this more modern, even for a turbo car. One of the main ones would be, if you're to drive the car really hard and then come to a stop and have to shut the car off, this can keep pumping fluid through the system to cool off your turbos, even when the car shut off. You'll hear this running if you drove the car hard, even as you walk away. So it can pump coolant through the turbos to keep them cool. Back in the day, you used to have to run a turbo timer to be able to keep uh, the engine running for a couple minutes as you walk away from it, just to pump coolant and oil through the turbos to make them last. But with this, you could pump coolant through the turbos right where you shut the car off and you don't have to think about it. There's a feature you wouldn't see anymore. You could hit that button, 
pump fluid through your heater core, stay warm on a winter's day. If the car was already fully warmed up, you don't have to keep the engine running. So that's technically more modern in a way. So this kind of goes without saying, but of course the bleed procedure is a lot easier when you can just completely purge a system of air with the key on and not need to warm up the car at all to completely bleed it. We'll be doing that later in the video. So that's definitely an advantage, just an easier bleeding procedure because the car can stay nice and cool while you're purging it of air. That's the highest point in the system. It'll purge out any air with the car being stone cold. Another advantage would be the fact that this doesn't have to run at full speed when the car is stone cold. So it could run at a much slower speed to let the coolant percolate in the block a little bit longer before it starts circulating through the heater core and before it starts opening the thermostat to allow for a quicker warm up and more comfortable interior temperature because this doesn't have to go based on idle RPM. It can run even slower than that under those circumstances. The main thing would be, can you get the engine warmer faster within like the first 30 seconds or minute to get to cleaner emissions faster? That's another factor. I don't think this is the case with the N54 considering this runs at 400 watts, but technically if the coolant isn't fully warm, it doesn't necessarily need to pump at full speed at wide open throttle. It could easily just uh, pump enough to keep the engine temperature stabilized. I'm not sure if it's a factor here, but technically you can save a few horsepower under load if this doesn't need to spin at full speed. It would only draw theoretically like half a horsepower or a little bit more than that. It won't rob the engine of six or seven horsepower at redline. Because this pump can respond to coolant temperature and it can respond to throttle input. It doesn't necessarily have to react to engine RPMs. I'd imagine at highway speeds, potentially this is running a little bit slower than it would be if it was just spinning with the engine at 2,500 RPM. Therefore, it doesn't need to rob as much miles per gallon away from the car. So it's not visible from up here, but obviously you have your thermostat, which normally would open when a certain temperature is reached. So you'd have to have a buildup of temperature inside the coolant in the block, and then it's gonna get to its threshold point, and then it's gotta open that door and allow for the coolant temperature to drop so it'll be up about 10 degrees and then drop it back down it's constantly cycling up and down up and down reacting to the current situation but what the pump can do is just run a little bit faster or slower to stabilize and not have the thermostat work as hard that way you can target a very specific coolant temperature and hold it there steady so you get the perfect burn for emission sake now on the b58 i don't have it anymore i used to have an m340i if you didn't know but the b58 uses a traditional mechanical water pump but they also maybe it wouldn't benefit so much from an electronic water pump nowadays. It's hard to say, maybe you guys can chime in on what you think of that. But on the B58, for instance, I believe on this car too, they have a split cooling system, so they'll keep the engine block at a set temperature, a uh, higher temperature than the head, so therefore you can get a cleaner, more aggressive burn in the block by regulating the temperature between the cylinder head and the block. So you don't really need the water pump to do that, you can kind of just control to allow more heat in the block than there would be in the head. So that's potentially a benefit right there. And they also run higher fuel pressure now. So you get uh, a cleaner burn anyway. So you don't necessarily need to maintain a perfect temperature in the block anyway. But if you were gonna aim for a temperature in the block, you'd want it to be hotter anyway. So on this car with this mechanical water pump, and like most cars, at a high RPM, or even if you're just holding a lower gear because you're driving a little more spirited, you're spinning that water pump at a set speed and it's going with the engine and it's forcing coolant through at a set speed no matter what. You just gotta go with it. There's nothing that can be done otherwise. There's no clutch to disengage the water pump, etc. So it's just spinning and being a little less efficient than it could be otherwise. But the trade-off is you have really aggressive flow at red line and it can keep up with a car like this. So with these modern transmissions and lots of gears to choose from, this is probably not as much of a factor, but imagine you had a manual car and you're towing something behind you and going up a grade, you generate a lot of throttle input, but not necessarily a lot of engine RPMs. What that could lead to is a lot of coolant temperature being built up in the block that can't be removed fast enough until the thermostat can react and can get pre-ignition or knock, etc. So, you know, with these cars, they will respond and drop RPMs and the DME is more efficient and more logical to deal with those situations. However unlikely it would be, I could technically not have to worry about that. I could leave it in six gear up a grade while towing something in this car and be giving it half throttle, kind of lugging the engine, but generating a bunch of fuel being introduced into the engine, which is gonna in turn be, be a bunch of extra heat. 
and this will react by spinning faster because it's going to see the coolant temperature and throttle input and adjust accordingly. And the only way to deal with that normally would be to downshift to bring the engine RPMs up to spin the mechanical water pump faster if it had one. So why did BMW stop using electronic water pumps? So I think one thing's for sure, lawsuits probably didn't help the cause. 65,000 miles and $1,500 for your average consumer wasn't reasonable and compared to other brands, even though this has benefits, but also the power figures have been increasing with time to the point where if they don't run electronic water pumps on M cars, that means that if you push a regular car to M car levels in terms of performance, it's probably gonna be an issue. So maybe they've pushed the limits so high and increased the fuel pressure so much that, and you know, adopted things like split cooling, where maybe these are not really gonna be that beneficial. And when you factor in their cost versus uh, how long they last, et cetera, it doesn't balance out. But at the end of the day, you'd have to say, well, hey, can't they figure out a way to couple this along with all those other benefits on a regular model like a four cylinder that's only going to make 250 horsepower to get the ultimate efficiency possibly but i think it just wasn't worth the headache so assuming this was the b58 you'd probably be spending three to six hundred dollars all in to get the water pump replaced and hopefully last over a hundred thousand miles so your total cost of ownership would be significantly cheaper on that and you know i don't think you'd really want to spend the premium for slightly more efficiency anyway in my opinion, one thing's for sure, if this would have lasted 120,000 miles, we probably would still have them. And they may have been a little more aggressive to deal with the new power levels of the more modern cars. One benefit that I actually leveraged at one point was my belt broke because my power steering pulley smacked my subframe and cracked, chewed up the belt. I was on the highway far from home and I could drive for quite a distance on the electronic water pump because my battery was still charged. That was a benefit that we wouldn't have nowadays. If you guys are looking for my advice as to when this should be changed proactively for maintenance, I'm gonna call it at around 60 or 65,000 miles just to be safe because if it fails on a long road trip, you'll be in trouble. So besides the holes and bolts, I would also recommend that you replace the thermostat at the same time. Mine just happens to be newish. That's why I'm not replacing it, but you would wanna get that on order. And I'll put a link in the description for this hardware if you guys are interested. If you were to look at a water pump from a B58, it wouldn't look very different than one from 30 years ago. Uh, it's a very simple design. And that's the reason why I titled this video this way, because no matter how you slice it, that's gonna seem like a more modern version of a water pump compared to what comes on the new cars. So I've scanned for codes and I had none, but my symptoms were my fan would run at high speed when the car's cold for no reason at times. And it would cycle quite often in high speed under normal driving. You could hear it happening. I've popped the cap off when it was safe to do so, uh, even though the car was fully warmed, and I would notice that there was no circulation at times. So it seems like the pump is intermittent on the car, but it has probably 70,000 miles on it plus. That summarizes everything I wanted to talk about on the electronic water pump being more modern on these cars. We're gonna go to the DIY now. And to be honest with you, I kind of wish this car didn't have this because I'm pushing the power so hard that that thing is probably not able to keep up under certain circumstances. But do I feel like the new 330i's, the B48, should have an electronic water pump due to its benefits? Yeah, why not? So I'm gonna get the car jacked up now and we'll start from underneath. I'm gonna go underneath the car and zip out the under tray. As you can see here, there's the water pump. The sway bar is in the way, and then this power steering cooler line is in the way. So we're gonna have to remove that. Normally you would put a 10 mil on here and you have to hold the top of it with a 17 mil wrench, but this is already ripped. So I just have a zip tie. Probably the last person to have ever done this job did that. So, but 10 mil, 17 mil wrench, you loosen that and you remove this line out of the way. Next up is the sway bar, two 13 mils. Now that can just hang out of the way. We're gonna be draining from here. You ready for a big mess, potentially? So there's these two 10 mil bolts here that screw the thermostat housing to the water pump. We're gonna release those. I'll release this electrical connector for the water pump. I just unplugged the thermostat sensor plug. I'm not replacing my thermostat, but I'm just doing this to get it out of the way. That's the thermostat plug. Put one of the bolts back in for the thermostat housing just so I can get the front hose off. So right here, it's a bit of a difficult shot, but in between the subframe and this lower hose, I'm sticking a screwdriver in to disengage the clip for the hose that goes to the front of the thermostat housing. Just sliding it up and out of the way. And I put one of the bolts back in just so I can pry the holes off easily. 
So we got the lower rad hose off the front of the thermostat housing. So you should probably do that before you remove these two bolts. So the lower rad hose going to the thermostat housing was removed just so you could be able to stick an E12 on a universal with an extension in between to be able to get to the top water pump bolt. So I would have liked to be able to get you a better shot of that, but you can see where I stuck my extension in. It was just a swivel E12 on a long 3 8 inch extension. As long as you get that lower rad hose disconnected, you'll be able to get it in between. Now I'm gonna loosen these bolts here for the water pump. So hopefully your clamps are positioned in a good way to get them out easily. Uh, you're gonna wanna get the pump loose before you go after the inlet to the pump. It's gonna make your life a little bit easier and then you can get access to that clamp. Take the hose off. So there's a couple more clip-on coolant hoses if you wanna remove the thermostat housing altogether. Like I said, I, it's recommended at the same time as the water pump unless you've changed it independently. So there's one on that side and one down here. Then you can completely remove the thermostat housing. So I guess uh, an improvement they made over time is there's now rubber isolators built into the water pump. So it's always gonna be able to free float on here instead of being rigidly bolted to the block. So the vibrations won't necessarily burn out the motors quickly. That wasn't really that bad in my opinion. Even with filming, it was less than a couple hours for me. So I'm going to put the sway bar back into position now. I just clipped it in the lower rad hose that feeds the thermostat housing. Since I bolted it rigid, it was easy to snap it into place. So we're gonna go to the top now and initiate the bleed procedure. I'd recommend that you leave this lower cover off until you have bled the system and verify that there's no leaks and then you can put your cover back on. So we're done from down here. All right, so I set up a battery charger running at 25 amps so I can run the bleed procedure. All right, so make sure your headlights are off. Key in the on position. Put the temp all the way to 84 or all the way up. Fan on its lowest position and just press the accelerator pedal for 10 seconds. This will take about 10 minutes or so, and then we'll top it up and conclude this video. All right, the bleeding procedure is done. All right, we're in good shape, no leaks. Everything bled properly. And to be honest with you, there's tons of good DIY videos for water pumps uh, for this chassis. I just did it because you guys asked for my input whenever possible. Some of you guys wanna see the way I would do something, but I was more interested in talking about how these water pumps were pretty advanced for their time. So if this is the first video you're catching of mine, please consider subscribing. If you liked the video, please give it a like so it can rank higher. Thanks for watching.